When you think about Choctaw traditional culture, it's something that was created cumulatively over about 600 generations when our ancestors lived in the Choctaw homeland. So when we practice Choctaw traditional culture, it connects us with those 600 generations of forebears, it connects us with our homeland and with all the places that our ancestors lived in the past. So today, even as a removed tribe, the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, when people speak the Choctaw language, when people do traditional arts, when people do traditional food, all of that connects us back with our homeland, including places like Moundville. That was home to a lot of uh, groups of our people. And a lot of Southeastern tribes came from that group. Moundville was like a ceremonial center for an extended farming community along that river. And it had connections with farming communities located in other areas, such as the Tom Bigby River, a little more close to the heart of the Choctaw homeland. At the height of Moundville, you know, about 1250 AD or so, um, there were half as many people living there as in London at the same time. You know, it was the second largest Native American community north of the Valley of Mexico at that time. The connection uh, between the mounds is uh, evident. And um, it's evident on the uh, pottery. This pottery right here is, is I got the clay from uh, Moundsville and um, I cleaned it. The leaves and the rocks and the sticks out of it and cleaned it, then I molded it. You know, the clay and the Choctaw language is lokfinia, that means the, the fat of the earth. I was like in awe because I, I looked around, there was these mounds all over the place. There's one big one when you first go in, there's one big one and there's some smaller ones. And then I've never seen nothing like this. I was never able to do anything like this when I was younger. I didn't, I didn't know about it. And when I seen that, it just kind of, uh, It was awesome. When people make traditional pottery out of Moundville clay, or when people make it out of clay from the Tom Bigby River, different places in our homeland, they're, they're reconnecting with ancestors like that. Man, I made, I can make these things now. You know, it's not any different than what they made, and, and I can use this as cooking, or putting my medicine in and crushing it, or boiling my, uh, things for plants, for medicines, you know, and eating out of and storing things in, things like that. I just, and that's what they did with a long time ago. When Choctaw folks left the homeland on the Trail of Tears to come to Oklahoma, one of the things that they carried with them were clay eating bowls. And that wasn't just so they would have something to eat in, but those clay eating bowls represented the homeland. They were literally made from the soil of the Choctaw homeland. And not only that, but pottery making is a, a tradition that goes through the female line. So when they were carrying those clay eating bowls, they were carrying the homeland and the female line with them. I never linked it till I seen that. It's just, I don't know, it's overwhelming now. You know, just, I'm doing things that they done a long time ago. And, and it started out with just being for myself. People in this culture today have a lot to learn from that, from the ancestors. Our ancestors buried our, our uh, their dead right there at home, which means we revered the bones, we revered our ancestors. They respected the, the remains and I don't think they ever had a problem of, you know, anybody disrespecting. And now we're not trying to be unkind, but it was the non-natives that sort of brought that problem. And because uh, natives respected burials, they never bothered it. And so that was just the way it was that we were taught that it's a sacred, Place, you don't go around it, you just leave it alone. The Choctaw word today for a funeral 
the process of a funeral service is ayakshuchi. Ayakshuchi means, ay means a location, ikshuchi means to make it disappear. Now, that has to be a Christian concept because if you recall, Choctaws didn't bury their dead. They put it on a scaffold and a scaffold and then they would wait for however long the body began to decay. And then that's when the bone picker would go up there and selected the bones and handed it down to the relatives for it to be put in a bone house. If you if you look at this uh, from the way that a Choctaw would be looking at it, it was very therapeutic because it was a long uh, time of grieving and, and, and the Choctaw would, would come and the relatives would come when they feel like it and the body would be up on a scaffold and they had time to cry, they had time to talk, they had to do anything. It's a gradual let go. So that's what, for generations, that's how they were taking care of their deceased. But when Christianity came, they were taught to to bury the dead in the ground. And so that would make sense when this is Ayik Shuchi means a place where it suddenly disappears. So to the Choctaw mind, instead of three month long duration of watching a disease decay out, they all of a sudden it's gone. You know. And so that word came about, I Ikshuchi, means to me a place to make it disappear. You know, as our ancestors rest, as they lay in rest, they got their bones disturbed. <clears throat> their earthly remains are not being respected, not being left to rest. Our sacred objects were taken out of our, our sacred sites and held in uh, institutions. And uh, NAGPRA opened our eyes to what history did to our people. NAGPRA stands for the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. It was essentially legislation that opened up conversations that Native American communities were never able to have before so that we could understand exactly where our ancestors are. Um, we know that they were taken out of our homeland. We know that they were excavated at different points in time. So we're able to go and, and knock on these doors and be able to find them. One of the incidents that helped to bring advocacy for creating what became NAGPRA about was an instance where there was a, a cemetery that, would, that had to be moved because of a construction project. And the other ethnic groups that were in that cemetery, you know, their remains were exhumed, but then they were ultimately reburied. But there happened to be a few native people in that cemetery, and their graves were exhumed and then put onto a shelf in a collection and never got reburied. It's because of that different standard that NAGPRA was ultimately created. Our ancestors were dug up, put on display, studied, and never put back. And as Choctaw people, we feel like it is our duty to rebury them. I appreciate the NACPA process that we have going on that, that's it's gotten better and it's gotten good at, uh, at collecting a lot of the bones from the, a lot of the institutions. And a lot of them are starting to realize that, uh, that uh, they ought to be respectfully placed back where they came from. I began doing NAGPRA work for the Choctaw Nation uh, when I was still a student. It was before uh, I began working full time for the tribe. It was in 2008. But one of my jobs was to look through the collection and see which things probably did come from burials, which I did. You know, there were multiple, multiple levels of that. Um, some of the artifacts were modern reproduction, so it involved looking for tool marks and that kind of thing. You know, if That's been years ago when I worked with NAGPRA. But what I remember was that uh, it was a new new program for us. So it was around the early years of 1990 when I was first exposed to the, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. A lot of 
of times we find inventories and they aren't really affiliated with the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and they're not really funerary. Um, sometimes they're actually cultural items that we can um, provide information for their collections and their teaching collections that are non-NAGPRA. The process itself is meticulous. It's mind-boggling <laughs> and there's roadblocks. There's uh, uh, papers with eyes to dot and all of that stuff. The first time we had to, uh, of course, we had to go to uh, classes to learn more about NAGPRA. And uh, that's when we had to travel to other tribes, to a lot of meetings. The last person that I hired to um, take the training, we took it together and learned the laws and everything about it and decided that this was an important part of our Choctaw people, especially our ancestors. As Choctaw Nation Historic Preservation Department has, has gained more staff, um, more positions, more folks that are trained in different areas, we've been able to create a full-time NAGPRA coordinator, um, NAGPRA liaison position, and that person is able to spend a, a good bit of her, her work hours doing this. She's been systematic about it, you know, going state by state, um, contacting every conceivable federal collection in that state and setting up consultation. When I first um, started on this project about three years ago, I was very enthusiastic. Um, coming from a research background, I thought, oh, it's going to take me a year. I'm going to know exactly where they are. We're going to have them all repatriated. This is going to be great. And I had a dear friend um, in the NAGPRA community tell me, you know, this is multi-generational work. And I really had to let that sit in. Our hope is to be able to search the United States and at least know where our ancestors are. They may not all be repatriated in my lifetime, but it, we're trying to find them. Part of that process is we, we have a documentation campaign and we reach out to all of these institutions. We send them a packet and we ask them for their inventory. We share their research document with them in hopes that they can search their database. And then we, we hope to have a really meaningful dialogue. We work through the legal process to repatriate them so that they can come home. Um, or that we can rebury them as close as possible to where they were originally excavated from. If we are not able to get them back as close as we can, then we try to um, find a, uh, a forest or uh, a private location that we can do that. So when we started to rebury uh, some of the bones that we uh, got back from the, from the other institutions through the NACPA process, we had to come up with a ceremony because there is no ceremony for reburials. And we wanted to do it with as much respect and honor as possible. It wasn't something that we thought we would have to do. I mean, you know, who grows up thinking that they're gonna have to rebury their grandma? So, you know, you don't, it's something that we just don't grow up doing is thinking that we have to do this. And so, the advisory board really came around to, you know, say, what do we need to do? This is the, this is what's came up. How do we rectify it? And how do we get these people, um, our ancestors, you know, back at peace? The Choctaw Nation NAGPRA Advisory Board was created, uh, I believe, in 2009. And it, its purpose was to bring together respected cultural leaders to advise on, on the NAGPRA work that the Choctaw Nation Historic Preservation Department did. Sometimes questions come up and you know they're, they're difficult to answer, either culturally or in terms of procedure or relationships with other groups. So this board advises us to make sure that we follow Choctaw culture, that we follow the will of the community as we're doing this work. And some of these questions have to do with really developing ceremony that we're never meant to have. Um, they were, um, asking questions about protocols on how to prepare our ancestors to be brought home for repatriation. So we've, we've taken an approach, you know, with the NACPRA advisory board and also <clears throat> with two different religious leaders. You know, one of those people is Les Williston. He's a traditional Choctaw religious practitioner. The other person is Olin Williams. And he's a first language Choctaw speaker, lots of cultural knowledge, and he's also a cultural minister. It was, it was trial and error because we have been Christians for so long now, and now uh, these remains uh, 
maybe most of them were not from you know Christian time. So some people thought that we need to do as traditional as we can. And then some felt like, well, we're Christians now, so we need to do a Christian ceremony. So what we did was we combined the two. And uh, I would do the, the Christian prayer, and then uh, Les Williston would do the traditional. That way we covered both. One time we had to bury a whole bunch of people. Took a, dug all the holes. And then we started this, started the work, started the ceremony, and clean each hole, clean the, clean the ground. That's for blessing, that's for forgiveness. We do all the things that uh, I had put together for it. But I didn't know. I didn't know when I climbed into that grave what it was gonna feel like to take these bones of our ancestors and put them in the grave one by one, one by one. When you start, when you feel that, when you, when you get them handed to you and you pick them up, you feel that energy, bones and skulls and baby bones. I broke down. I couldn't help it. Couldn't stop it. And it, it was a, that was a powerful time. And I'll never forget it. My uh, first experience working with a group of students who were archeologists helped us rebury some of the ancestors and as we were reburying them and putting them back, they started crying, you know, when we sung our songs. And I think they felt like what their ancestors did was wrong. And they felt it as they were putting back those bones that belonged to our people. I think the hardest inventory that I had, or the hardest experience that I had was going through an inventory and um, realizing that at the time that this child was brought in, that the curation staff had made the decision to separate that child, that small child from their carved bone comb. And I still feel that. It was very early on. It was one of my very in first inventories that I ever reviewed and looked through and it's always stuck with me that, um, you know, just envisioning the mother there, the relatives there at that gravesite for that small child and placing that bone comb there. Um, as a mother myself, um, losing a child myself, I imagine what that was like. And um, I had to kind of take a break and step away um, for a little while because, you know, it's real. You know, that little girl um, was real. It was, it was really disheartening and, you know, you go into that, you go into that place and, you know, you think, again, that's my family. Being there with Deanna and helping her um, just be able to get through this inventory is something that, to me, I don't think you can do alone. We, we sit, we talk. <laughs> we cry, <laughs> and then we pray, and really just to um, let the you know ancestors know that we're um, you know we're trying our best and we're going to do our best to help them have peace. It's been an honor being on the NACPRA board. Many of the things we talk about in there are, are, are uh, really interesting stuff. And, uh, and there, there's a, we find out there's so much that has to be done. The 30 year mark of NAGPRA, um, we find ourselves with a, a tremendous amount of work left to be done. 
And in the last 10 years, while I've been involved in doing NAGPRA work, there have definitely been positive developments. Um, there are coalitions between tribes that have been really helpful in seeing the law followed and seeing our ancestors respectfully returned and reburied. I feel really honored to be in this role and I have to, um, I have frank conversations with my children sometimes. They don't, uh, sometimes they'll buck, you know, when Missy and I have to go travel, they're like, why do you want to go, you know? And I'm like, you just got to give me three days of the ancestors and then I'll be back, you know? Um, and I let them know, you know, we're doing this so that you don't have to, that, you know, future generations don't have to do this. I just think that if our own young people would take time to listen to the elders and retain as much as they can about our value system, then we can improve NAGPRA. If they don't all come back from institutions in our lifetime, at least we know where they are. We've left no stone unturned um, so that we can find them. So, you know, to the institutions that still have our remains, have our funerary objects, or any of our artifacts, need to know that it belongs to our people, as well as other tribal nations, that they need to be returned to those people. Doing this work, it's, it's really um, powerful. You know, I've, I've seen things that Western science says don't exist, like repeatedly when we do this. You know, it's, it's the real thing. Um, and I'm so honored to be involved in that, you know, in just a small way getting to, to write, not even right or wrong, but just take it a little bit back towards how it should be. Just a, a little bit of honor. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to the, the Choctaw Nation for letting me do this work and to, to all the people who contribute. It's a, a big team effort.